all the other features were done, you know, separately. So they, they heard the track. I, I talked, we talked about what direction, you know, I wanted to go with the song. Mm. And they sent it back and we tweaked it. But with Thought, he was the only one I actually worked in the studio with. He's looking at me recording. And then all he says was, oh, that's how you feel? Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official Com. THTC, the UK's leading ethical streetwear label. Organically grown and ethically built garments from hemp, organic cotton and other sustainable materials. 2019 is their 20th anniversary year. Join me with THTC as a Killer Keller podcast sponsor celebrating music, social activism, hemp and street culture. THTC, eco-fashion redefined since 1999. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller podcast in effect. Big shout out to Graffiti Kings. You can see I'm donning like a really fashionable set of headphones. If anybody's in the studio world, you know exactly what time it is because we are going Zoom in. We are blooming in Zoom in. This is the future of technology right here, baby. It gives us a chance to go international for music and street culture. We have Inside the Place, Sorok Inside. How are you, girl? I'm excellent. How are you? Good to be here. I'm good. The Nina Simone of rap. Come on. <laughs> wow. wow. That's high praise. I love her. Yo, man, I'm telling you, it's it's very rare. It's very rare that um, you get a, 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 an artist that that shares a, a, a level of integrity with the golden era of rap. Uh, you know, with the, the background knowledge and an understanding, which I think you hold, but yet still translatable, even more so translatable to a younger audience. I don't know. I, I just feel like your your message and the timeliness of like the the influences you have, you can hear them. You know what I mean? And it hits the marker. Do you know what I'm saying? I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, when I was discovering hip hop, you know, the people who attracted me were like the real MCs, like, you know, the Black Thoughts, like Pharaoh Munches, like Andre 3000, Lauren Hill, I'm working with Lauren Hill right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, and then I was always, I always, like you mentioned Nina Simone, like I had a love for like classic, those classic artists, whether it was classic soul or jazz or poetry, like so, like, Writing is really important to me. Messaging mm. is really important to me. Delivery is really important to me. So having that foundation, but also, you know, growing and creating a career in hip hop, you know, while music is changing and developing and turning into something new, allowed me to have the creativity and flexibility to create like relevant and timely music while also having that foundation, you know? Yeah. Foundation is key. I mean, yeah. with... With a lot of uh, these these artists you mention, um, their identity st- is is the first thing that strikes. It's like a it's like you know a good saxophonist playing you know the notes on 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 their instrument. You've you you get those afflictions and those sounds and nuances, and before you know it, you know you get you know who's behind the instrument, right? And we we were of an ilk where you know Guru's voice <laughs> on Jazzmatazz was just like, yo, that's Guru. <laughs> you know what I mean? Doesn't have to be a gangster. That's definitely Guru. Yeah, your voice has that. It fits. I'm not. You know, it's it's a unique sound, and it was the first thing you know back when uh, that struck me. Do you know what I mean about your style? You could tell that you were filling in blanks that were already set up within the foundations of hip hop. That's the way it felt. I mean, that feels, that feels good. Um, you know, it took me a while to kind of figure out my voice. It's funny, like, yeah, like you're literally learning and growing as an artist. Like when I first started, um, you know, I had no um, really real background in hip hop. You know, it was just something I kind of stumbled into doing mm. um, as I met like my current producer, Soul Messiah. And, um, you know, I, my vocal tone was different. Um, but through like performances and stuff like that, I realized like I couldn't like spit in that register because I was going hoarse, like I was straining my voice and stuff like that. So, uh, you life. know, I'm recording at two o'clock in the morning or when I wake up in the morning, that deep, like kind of gravelly voice, like that's the voice that like I settled in. And that like 
I feel like delivered that power and stuff that the, the, the power of my lyrics and the power of my cadence and stuff like that, right. that. That was the best vehicle for that, you know? Hold on. So, so do you wake up at certain times to record with your voice in a certain, a certain, uh, uh, no. growlness? No, 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 no. It's just, just so happens that, you know, it'll take me all day to write something and then it'll be like, I'll be like, I'm done. <laughs> I mean, it's two o'clock in the morning. Let's get it done. You know, what burnt I mean? it, yeah, burnt the shit. You're just like, oh, my God, just just drop it now. I'm I'm sore enough. Let's go. Yeah, those are the best times for me to record. I don't like recording on a full stomach, um, and I like to do it when it's fresh, especially if there's a particularly um, complex cadence I want to be able to capture. You know, mm. I need my mind like, super fresh. I don't need to be um, weighed down or distracted by food or anything else throughout the day. I I know where you're coming from. There's there's a certain temperature in which you want to step into the booth, right? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's 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 part of that. It's part of that journey of trial and error. The trial and error that you talk about with your vocals. It still apl- it applies to the studio as well. You got to find the right producer. You got to find the right personnel. You know, how long did it take you to find your your current producer? I started working with him from jump. Like, That's crazy. He- who, yeah, he was the one that like gave me that vote of confidence to do it. Like I literally was just really trying to figure out my life. Mm. You know, I dabbled in like creative ventures and it wasn't even music all the time. It was, you know, I did some drama and, you know, did some Mm. singing or whatever. But like hip hop was like really something that I was just um, a listener of. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. poetry and stuff. And so when I met him, it just so happened that he was working with some other artists in Atlanta. And I just moved down to Atlanta and he was, he would make these like beat tape, beat CDs rather. Um, and I would listen to it and I would like really love like the beats and stuff. So like I wanted to see how I would sound recording like one of my poems to his music. And I'm, I'm like competitive. So I was like, let me see. I hear all these artists he work with. Let me see what I can Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, Reason in games. It was ballsy. Um, so I get in the uh I get in the studio, I record it, and um he said it wasn't bad. And he was surprised because one of his biggest things is being able to be to ride the beat, like to be rhythmic. Cause there oh, are a lot of- mm. Yeah, so he'll be like, yeah, I know a lot of people who can write, but they just like slightly off beat with the way that they write. Like, but you immediately, like that's a skill that needs to be learned, but you immediately like work on it. So he was like, hmm, you got some other stuff? You know, so I recorded some other stuff and I wrote some stuff to some of his beats and that ended up becoming like my first EP. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. I love the fact that um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, the devil's in the detail with emceeing. Like, like you say, the first hurdle the, uh, is the natural uh, reaction to a beat that producers look for in, a, in an MC or a singer. They really, you can't, you can't fake. You know, you can't fake that laid back. You know, some rappers really do fall into that laid back approach and they're kind of almost always offbeat. But then there's some that are just are delivering a message and are always on target. And once you find... It's such an it's a natural thing. You 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 you, you gravitate to either one or the other, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think that um, that that sharpness, like that, was the first thing that I wanted to like that that came through with my delivery because it's really important for me to articulate, right? So yeah. like being being in front of. And I think that may come from like my drama background too, like being in front of crowds, like being taught to like, you know, express words and making sure that the audience can hear you and as you enunciate. So it's really me to when I rhyme to give that same, you know, clarity and, you know, articulation with my words. And I feel like that um, was a kind of a big influence for my approach to rap. And then because I, I'm wordy, I'm a wordy ass MC. So like, it's important for me if I'm trying to get all of these words into this bar or this verse, I need for you to be clear about what I'm saying. Like it can't be muddled, you know what I mean? Oh so, my God, yeah. I get exactly <laughs> what you mean. Yeah, you get it? 
the choice as well the choice of words that um so that it's that, that i guess the term is scanning when you're reading and it scans right it fits the the flow sometimes you can clock an mc and you're just like yo like that that okay some words by default don't aren't meant to rhyme but at least make it i don't know at least get it in a pocket where it's the flow feels like it's got so some miss that completely don't they yeah that's and that's perfect get it in the pocket like that's that's it yeah. you know i i'm i'm like a super perfectionist so i will keep recording messiah will be like so i'm sorry like oh my god it's good i'm like no it has to be sharp you know yeah. like yeah, yeah. it has to be in that pocket before yeah. i feel like i can move on and, and be okay with what I've, I've recorded you know for sure and i could be wrong but when i when I hear your stuff, I don't for a second think you're being dropped in at any point. It sounds to me like because of the, the succession of uh, of uh, um, uh, of words and riot, the, the way it's formulated, there's an energy to it, and you can clock when someone's being dropped in. Do you know what I mean? But with you, I hate punching in. yeah, to the point that so I am like he he's like oh my gosh, just punch <laughs> I'm like no, oh, like it is the the principle of the thing, you know, yeah. and especially since I'm going to have to perform this. I can't mm -hmm. like, like the whole art of this thing is to be able to, you know, deliver this the way I would deliver it on stage if I'm performing or whatever. Um, and I yeah. want that energy. I want that vibe to be palpable when people hear the record. Yeah. You know I, mean? I want it to have a seamless kind of flow. Exactly. And, you know, like you were saying about the transience and your uh, delivery every time you hit a, hit a word, um, that, that can take energy. And if you're not working like from A to Z of a whole verse, then you, you really are going to be selling yourself short on the live show. You'll be, <gasps> you'll be out of breath and like killing yourself and shit. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I feel it. I feel it. Um, where are you based at the moment? Where's home? Atlanta. Uh, I've never been to Atlanta. How is it over there? Cool. You know, Atlanta is like the turn up town. A lot of people come here and they love it because of like um, the nightlife scene and bars. And then like a lot of the artists are here. And, and recently, more recently, they've been doing like tons of filming and stuff here. So it's kind of like the, the Hollywood of the South, you know. Oh, so I like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's for cool. Me, for me, it was tough because I come from D.C. So mm. like there's like a ton of stuff like compressed in, you know, yeah. areas and stuff, like a ton of stuff going on or whatever. I'm more into like super cultural stuff. Like I love like tons of museums. I love like really creative events. If I'm going to go to like an event, I'm not the club girl. Like I need to, I need for like a party to be curated and jazz Jeff to be spinning in, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I need something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, but it's cool because Atlanta is home to so many creatives. I mean, visual artists. I came up, I started rhyming in the independent music scene in Atlanta. Right when like trap music and all that stuff was popping, like right, when they were transitioning out of like all yeah. the stuff that Renaz was doing with Dungeon Family and stuff, with um, Outkast and all that. Mm -hmm. And so there was this movement that was created out of Atlanta from transplants from, you know, Detroit, New York, and from Atlanta as well. And I, I fit right in there. People were, artists were, you know, not going through promoters. They were creating their own shows. They were booking clubs on their own. They were, Sick. like, so a lot of people I still work with today, I don't know if you're familiar with Lyric Jones, for example. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, um, MC, but, like, I, me and her used to do shows together. Like, she, you know, tapped me for a show. She used to come up from college to Atlanta and, like, do shows, do live shows and stuff. So like I love that about the energy of all of the creatives, creatives who are here. That mm -hmm. energy still sustained. You can see that through like the murals and the wall art, and like you know that's constantly happening and popping up all over the city. For sure, yeah. Hey, we're all about this on this podcast. We're 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 street culture through and through. And uh, yo, you said outcast. Oh my god! Like talk about some celebrate celebrate actually celebrated unsung heroes <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah. yeah they really like they they changed the shape of rap and you know really represented they really represented that kind of diverse broad you know st still got the atl play in the game there but you've but you know just the 
the Love Below album was, you know, it's just a complete and utter game changing event in music, full stop, right? Yeah, it was beautiful. So it was perhaps, a, yeah. Yeah, it was just a really dope, creative offering, you know. Mm. If, you know, his, and the thing is, like, well, I mean, we can say it, Dre is not like a classical singer or anything like that, but mm. he had um, this concept and we didn't care that, you know, he's not this perfect technical singer, mm. but he's singing these songs and, and they feel like straight up ballads. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, they, uh, <laughs> I hope that you're the one, like the prototype and all that stuff. Like, it's just, it's just. That should just well. Let me stop cursing because I don't know if you can curse me. So it's you just do, this is your podcast. You could do whatever you want, love. Okay. It's just really timeless <laughs> music, and you can tell he was just drawing from all the things, all yeah. the influences that he loved, and he wasn't worried about fitting into a box. He hadn't worried about that for years. Mm, but I that's right. Took this creative leap with that album. But when I first heard Outkast, when I tell you, I was like completely shook. When I saw <laughs> the player's ball video, I was like, what is this? Because I she had- said the, <gasps> You said the player's ball video. Did you know that's a Christmas song? I found that out. It was for the, um, the, uh, that label. What, what label are going on? Um, uh, RCA. It was, um, I can't remember what, what subsidiary it was, but I think it was RCA. It was, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is completely shocking. But when yeah. I saw it, I hadn't had much exposure to like Southern- culture and so a lot of the stuff that i heard was like bass music and stuff which i wasn't really into like mm. i listened to it but i wasn't really into and yeah. i immediately gravitated to what they were doing like mm. that soul that funk like it really um it really like uh highlighted some of the the kind of like the soul stuff that i grew up with like the the whole marching band culture like within like black culture and yo like, so like, true that's cold stuff all of that, like, just in this cool, pimped out, like, just, I, I, I fell in love. Mm. I fell in love. <laughs> wherever they went, wherever they were performing. I remember going to the Equimini <laughs> show in D.C., and they had a Cadillac, a Cadillac on stage bouncing with hydraulics on stage. Oh, my God. Those are the types of things that, that, that don't go away. And those no. are the things that to this day like i'm trying to get to that level you know yeah. what i mean you can yeah. totally transform like blow somebody's mind with your stage performance you know what i mean i love that you say that and you said it in the same subject matter of like oh, you said you've you've basically summarized what it isn't quite in existence at the moment in uh in music genre particularly in america now, I could be like really like walking down a bit of an unknown. It could be a spicy conversation. But a lot of a lot of people, they fit in to whatever genre is current. Right. And, and albeit like there was a lot of great music, new music, young music out there. Um, but sometimes I feel like maybe their ambitions are falling short because if you look at the ambitions of having a Cadillac on a <laughs> on hydraulics <laughs> on a stage and and taking uh, a whole culture genre into musical pastures where you could you know it's up there with like Beatles and you know artistry of like higher praise you know what I mean like sometimes I feel like some of the genres fall short and a lot of people have to fall in line with that and the music that we love get, gets lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that? I think, I mean, some of it has to do with, you know, budget. Of course, budgets were a whole lot bigger back then. So, like, you could play around with ideas and concepts and videos and, and stage performances that, you know, might be a little bit difficult to pull off these days. But, yeah, like, it, there's, a, there's a spirit of conformity that I'm not really feeling. In Me too. I'm with you. Of these days and times. Um, of course, there are people who are, you know, bucking that. You know, we have tons of artists that are, you know, I feel like J.I.D. is, you know, being really um, kind of switching up his 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 flow, sound, whatever. And I think you're coming with it. I think you're coming with it. Yeah, yeah. You're coming I with mean, it hard. 
talking about me. I'm just like discussing like other people in involved. But yeah, I'm, I mean, that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. I, the goal is to um, reject these confines of what we're supposed to be doing within. Mm-hmm. Like, I love the, the explorative, creative age where we were just trying to trying to find that, you know, that note that hadn't been touched yet, that, you know, that mm. concept that hadn't been introduced yet. You know, we're seeing yeah, a lot of heaps of sounds and videos and, you know, it's the same old Fruity Loops 808 kit. Everybody's using the same, you know. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. That's, that's what, you know, me and Soul Messiah try to do differently. Like we use different sounds. We use instrumentation, musicianship. Sometimes mm-hmm. we use 808, you know, but we do it in a different and kind of creative way. We maintain that boom bap sound. We use electric mm-hmm. guitars, like, you know, so, and I think that that challenges me as an artist too. Like, I don't, I, it's important for me to switch up my flow and switch up my cadence, cadence and find like um, unique ways to play around with the beat so that my, my delivery is never the same or, you know, mm-hmm. I can be you know, do a double time joint on this song, but do a straightforward joint on, on another. And, you know, it still feels very much Sara. Um, so yeah, like that's how I feel like we have created so many incredible uh, MCs because when we were allowed to be creative, when, you know, or we just were discovering, you know, all of the beauty and um, potential of hip hop, we were like sharpening our skill set at the same time. But now, like, everything is just so easy. Everything is just so, oh, yeah, this is the formula. You stick to this formula. And we don't yeah. see a lot of innovation and change out of a lot of artists. But, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Like, with someone said to me on a, on a recent podcast that the, the subject matter that exists in the world, I mean, if we were to really take every single song that was ever made, not only would we get, not have a chance to listen to it all, but um, there'd be a song for everybody. Uh, and everything as a subject matter, you know, if it's not been sung by, you know, the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, it's been sung by or rapped by a tribe called Quest or Public Enemy, doesn't mean that the message is any weaker. It just means that uh, there's a song for that. And one thing that this this particular person said was nowadays, the Travis Scotts of the world, the Post Malones of the world, they're dealing in emotions for specific times of the specific day, for, for specific lives, which I thought was a really interesting way of looking at new music and how people build themes on them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that, I don't know. I think that it, it's, it's touching on this new, this, this, this current generation is, is really, it's really unique in this, in this way that they're incredibly sensitive, but the sensitivity is hidden beneath this kind of veil of apathy. Yeah, 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 yeah for um, sure. So like the songs that are being created kind of play into that. Everything That's is- so way a way of putting it. You put it so right. And I've never heard it said like that. That is a hundred percent right. Yeah. So like the, the music kind of has this air of nonchalance, you know, yeah. but a lot of the stuff, if you dig into it, it does have a lot of meaning in it. And the, the, the subject matter that is being delivered, if you dig a little deeper with some of it, mm. um, it kind of touches on like really real issues that are being couched in this like kind of cavalier way, but like really real, like things like friends dying and, you know, having yeah. to do, like rough stuff, stuff in the streets and coming from, you know, these hardships, they're, they're, you know, drug problems and all of these things, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, um, it plays into that. Like, again, like, I don't care, you know, everything is so, you know, mm. all my friends are that, you know what I'm saying? Everything is just like a, 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 a thinly veiled like party anthem or whatever. But That's right. That's <laughs> right. You know, you're right. And it's, it's, it's that juxtaposition that kind of makes it endearing, isn't it? It's like you're trying to find the hidden meanings within, you know, very 
it's, there's subtleties in it and you just got to kind of dig a little deeper, I guess. Right. I kind of like it when like, I kind of like it when like rappers like yourself, you know, it's just to the point, you know what I mean? I like, I like that. I like everything, but I like the fact that there's this artistry out there that like yourself or like when Black Thought dropped that, God knows how many bars of delivery of freestyle verses. Just it was just like incredible, you know what I mean? It's just like the in raps, the 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 oh, the, the so much. There's so much, and you know that that's what that's what makes uh, makes me. There's got to be a technical side to any genre, right? You've got to have that. Yeah, yeah. Like that, I love raps that make me do that. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. What? What is yeah. one is that? You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, like you said, like there, there needs to be that technicality there. Um, you know, there, there is. Uh, what do they? What do they call it? There's that um, uh, classical jazz, which is fine. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what is that? Straightaway. What is it called? Straightaway jazz or whatever. And then there's the experimental jazz. Yeah. Like, there's, but like. There is something in that when I mean, you hear those trumpet notes, that staccato note where it's just so like on mm. or like, you know, even within like riffing on a guitar when you're yeah. when you're hearing the full scale of the guitar and like that, that just that technicality is like so beautiful. For real. And the same thing with like hip hop. Like to be able to hear someone play around with the vocabulary in such a way and still yeah. bring so much style and flavor to it, like Thought does. Like he's so like he'll just have on some shades and just be sitting back in his chair like this. Yeah, you know, yeah. Deliver an entire thesis through, you know, 48, 50 to 100 bars. Crazy. And whole world just like shook 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 do you think just going back to how you got into the game how you got into um rap and hip-hop do you think that that you know without you knowing it that that because you you were a fan but you weren't like you weren't a, a vocalist like that you weren't an MC like that you'd probably it was almost an afterthought once you had had a producer. You're like, actually, I might give this a go. But do you think that that having that as the framework of your entry into the scene, you're a lot more uh, apt at pointing out the the holes in the the holes in the tapestry. You're because you're not overly developed in your skill set as an MC. It just means that, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're able to kind of maneuver yourself into a position where you're just like, hang on, I like this about hip hop and that's not there. So I'm going to do this because no one else is here. Let's, let's go. Do you think there was an element of that? I think so. I think so. Um, I think probably because I didn't have the pressure of, again, having the, the having, learning the foundation of hip hop very early, but not having certain pressures of, mm. you know, what it means to be, an MC, like having to do certain things, it allowed me to develop my own sound while still having, of course, influences, but develop my own sound mm. that was based on what I didn't see, you know, yeah. what I didn't think was being fulfilled yeah. um, within the genre. Like when I first when I first started, I was heavily into like real metaphysical. Uh, content you know mm. and for me like I didn't see that really represented I mean it was a little you know Dre of course dealt with some of that Jay Electronic at the time was dealing with it mm. like, yeah. heavy, especially coming from a woman in hip hop yeah. um, so I imagine like being brought up in the culture and the ciphers and all that kind of stuff I might have just done what the boys did you know I might have just yeah. gone the route of you know I don't know, the, the kind of standard hip hop, you talk about how dope the MC you are, which I still do that, but I do it with my own like perspective, like from the standpoint of yeah. being a goddess and you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, I definitely feel like it, I was looking at it from the outside and trying to pinpoint a lane for myself 
Um, and not even super duper intentionally, like just kind of like taking who I was as a person and inserting that into um, what I created and how I was going to kind of present myself in within this career. You know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's a good place to be. Can you imagine what your throat would be like if you had been doing all those ciphers outside in the cold and stuff for you, the duration of your teens? That would just have been, <laughs> just would have been a whole different you. <laughs> Absolutely. The whole different thing. Um, how are you feeling about the album as a whole? How are you feeling about the projects that are currently in the part? Not long to go, neither, we might add, huh? Oh, um, yeah, it's uh, coming up soon, October 2nd. I feel Crazy. Good. I feel good about it. I feel like it's strong. I feel like it really tells the story of who I am and, you know, who I became in my journey of mm -hmm being an MC and then just in my growth and journey as a person. Um, I, there's some super crazy features as Black Thought is on there. Um, Styles P is on there. Chronix is on there. Saul Williams Legacy. So oh, I tight. work with some really, some people who I really admire, you know, on the album. And, I'm, and I think we created something that was really beautiful. The, the wish list. You must have sat there when, you know, Black Thought was coming through. So Williams coming through, you just must have been like, hold, hold on a minute, this is mad. You must have lost yourself for a piece there, huh? Yeah, but see, the thing with Thought, though, I've been working with him for a while, for some years. Like, he's he's a friend. Right. Um, so, I mean, it still in no way diminishes the awe I have for him as a writer, as an MC, as a person, you know? Mm. Um, but... With that one, it's funny, all the other features were done, you know, separately. So they, they heard the track, I, I talk, we talked about what direction, you know, I wanted to go with the song. Mm. And they sent it back and we tweaked it. But with Thought, he was the only one I actually worked in the studio with. Mm. I rarely do that. I rarely mm. do that. I'm always in the closet somewhere wearing some mismatched pajamas trying to write. <laughs> And then again, recording at two o'clock in the morning. So I was so nervous as much as, you know, again, I've worked with him. I've rocked with the roots on several occasions. Like he's brought me off for shows. I'm still Crazy. like super duper intimidated by this man and his writing skills. And, you know, he has 20, years, 20 plus years in the game. I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm a slow writer. So I'm, we're, we have two days in the studio in New York. We flew up there for that. And I'm like so nervous. I'm sitting next to him, like, and he's just, you know, he got great. He just come. He just came from the other, the um, the, another studio. He's working on like other yeah. projects. And stuff. He's chilling, like unbothered. Got you know, just casually writing down lines, talking, laughing. And I'm like, oh my god, why are you guys laughing? I'm so stressed right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Trying to focus, you know, just killing me. Trying to focus. It got so bad. I had to go out in the hallway. Like there's this little hallway outside. Everybody's all comfortable inside the studio. I'm in this little chair in the hallway with all kinds of like studio equipment stacked up around me, like writing. Yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. quietly dropping like little tips. He's like, yeah, you know, um, you know, what I do sometimes is uh, if I think of a bar, I'll just write it down on a little post-it note and like save it for later and just, you know, compile it. And, you know, if I come up with a 16, just like casually dropping these jewels or whatever. That I'm, I'll do it. I'm, I couldn't do with that. That would just, do my head in. <laughs> right, right. So like, all right, half of my part. And then, you know, we did the, um, we did the, a back and forth on the song. And uh, that was the other like kind of nerve wracking thing, having to like trade bars with him. So the second day they ended up going, because you know, he does the Tonight Show or whatever. So that's he, right. Yeah. They ended up leaving and going to do that. And so I had, you know, a couple hours in the studio to like fine tune my thing and do it like. like respite you needed. The respite you needed. And so when they came back, I was recording and he's looking at me recording. And then all he says was, Oh, that's how you feel? Okay. And like, I could tell, like, that was like his, his comments like that don't come lightly. So I, I was like, in my mind, I was like, Okay, yeah, I did. I did. I got this. I got this. Yeah, I got this. <gasps> I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
That's amazing. I fucking love it. I love it. What other jewels? What other what other jewels does he get into in the studio? What other? Give us some more. Give us some more uh, intel. Right, right. Well, I mean, he just. That was like the one thing because everything else with him is very, um, oh, like the other thing what, where he was like, yeah, you know how, you know, when you set up, a, um, he said, when you set up a, a verse, like just have the first few bars like casual. Cause like when I, when I run, like I attack. Yeah. You go in. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. And he was just like, like the first few, the first maybe four bars, like just kind of like set it up and then like, you know, you go in or whatever. So I was like, okay. Okay, like just cash at first, just a little cash when you first started the beat, and then like you know he's like just give it to him after that, and um I, I you know of course I meticulously catalog that in my mental rolodex is like things I would you, buy on my next. You set. would do, yeah, you would do. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that, that that he is, you know, someone who I feel like is also profoundly underrated for his brilliance. Oh my God, not only, uh, totally. Not only is he just, you know, you know, he freestyles, he effortlessly performs, he delivers, whatever, but he is also just like someone who is intent on just really elevating the culture yeah. um, in a way that I instantly gravitated to. Because for me, like, I feel like hip hop is deserving of a place in the art world that, um, like a fine art, you know, and I think it's still not given the respect that it deserves. And so that's one of my goals as an artist to, again, going back to the Nina Simone, like creating music that people still reference years, you know, you yeah. know, and, 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 you know, we're starting to see it in classes and we're starting to see, um, you know, curated uh, um cataloging of like you know albums and, and liner notes and stuff at different colleges and stuff sure. but i need to get to that you know level where it's unquestioned you mm. know it's funny mm. when i i did um the this npr at the tiny desk concert um where i performed and their goal is to really get hip-hop more into the eyes and ears of these you know, liberal listeners who are used to listening to like this obscure jazz and classical music and bluegrass. For real. Like, all of these genres that, you know, are respected within these these um, um, forms of like American music. And For sure. hip hop still is not seen as, it's seen as like street call. I mean, it is. It comes from street culture, but it it also is this elevated articulation of what the that what the street is, the pulse yeah. of what is happening, like the social environment, you know. That's right. All of that. So empowerment as well, like this music yeah, of empowerment. empowerment. It, and it, the global influence is like mad. Mad. And the fact that we're still fighting for you know these. Um, these circles, these intellectual circles for us to recognize how important it is within, you know, music is, is, is maddening to me. Yeah. Um, with me, without question, it's maddening. It's, it's when you go so far back, when you go so far back to early public enemy, which these, you know, these, and I say them because, you know, I was, I think I was about 11 years old when I first heard that. And these were like news reports. These became news reports, you know, whether you could kind of, you know, glamorize boys in the hood. It's, it's, it was actually way more, you, you had to, you had to purposefully put that tape in the cassette, listen to it and listen to it. Good. You know, um, share Copper's daughter. Um, that, that's a, that's, I have no doubt that's going to play in the same way The the message within that, it's going to be heavy and intent. And like you were saying about some of the other contemporaries out there, like Black Thought and, you know, Farrah Monch as well. You know, when you put them in the category of like artistry that, uh, you know, like a hip hop hall of fame level of artistry, like yourselves, I put you all in the same category of lyricists that, you know, hold a torch for decades, man. Do you know what I mean? They, and they should, they should be heralded as a, as a, as a real, definitive 
line of art, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Because honestly, if we think about what the the what emceeing comes from, you know, it comes from the the oral historian or the the griot in West Africa, where these people were using song, you know, to mm-hmm. talk about what was happening. You know, they were documenting what was happening. They were sharing what was happening through through their words and through like this method of creativity. And we can literally look back at hip hop from its inception to now and understand what was happening in the world and, and, you know, within society at the time, Mm -hmm. you know, it literally is an audio um, almanac, if you will. You know what I mean? We ain't used that word in podcast before. Go on. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, from style to, you know, uh, to slang, to, you know, uh, social commentary, to uh, just kind of like just the pulse of every decade, you know, you can look back and see what that was. Um, And I think that honestly, there's not a lot of other genres that did that. You know, Mm -hmm. I I feel like um, they're, there are genres that capture the energy, but as far as like literally being this, the sonic um, documentation of, of what, how the world is being shaped and formed. The soundtrack, the, yeah. The soundtrack yeah, like, to, yeah. Literally the soundtrack of what's happening. Um, and it just needs, we need to get, we need to get the respect for that. And that's sure. honestly, Sarah Proper's daughter is, is, I mean, that was the intent of it. Like, I'm wearing another classic album on my shirt right now. Just like, Come you know, on. Come on. Like, because, like, it's important for me to create music that, like, really tells a story. And we talk about, when we talk about Feral Munch, like, he's literally, he has the, the um, still standing song where he's, you know, with Jill Scott and he's talking about asthma and, you know, all of that or whatever. And then Black Thought, you know, he's with his Streams of Thought album, he's talking about his background in Philly growing up or whatever and being able to Mm. tell those stories in a way that keeps people riveted and also, you know, doing that neck nod and like, yeah. holding, you know, creating something that people can hold dear to them. Like all these books that I have on my, you know, bookshelf here, like to uh-huh. create works of art through like your music, which is what the intention was with Cher Proper's daughter, like to tell my story through the backdrop of my father's story, um, who was born on a Cher Proper's farm in Jim Crow America. And like kind of couple that with my my experience growing up in, you know, the crack era of Washington DC at the time mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. how like, all these things kind of influenced my voice and articulated my voice um, so that I can, you know, really talk about how these experiences of blackness in America shaped me in more ways than one not through the trauma of it and through mm-hmm. the resilience that, you know, I developed and my father developed and my people developed through experiencing that. And mm-hmm. like this, that journey, of who we become, you know, mm-hmm. through enduring like all of these little, these aspects of life that can threaten to kind of take us down. But, Don't you know, see. how we triumph through the through that. And that's what I wanted to convey through the sharecropper's daughter. Yeah. And um, yeah, like I'm, ex- I'm really excited about it. I can't wait till it comes out. How many tracks are on there? There are, I'm not good with memorizing stuff like that, but um, there are, I'll pull it up right now. There we go. Hey, we got this. <laughs> yeah, here's one I made earlier. <laughs> There's 16 tracks on there. 16 tunes. Are you got it on, is it coming out on vinyl? It looks like it's going to come out on some like limited vinyl piece, yeah? Long time coming. Oh my wow. gosh. How excited I've been to get an album on vinyl. For real, I'm telling you, man. They, that's such an overlooked thing. Like you, to have something that's essentially yours and been produced. The, the, the commitment in making that happen is super real nowadays, right? Yeah, yeah. Fifteen tracks. I was wrong. 
15, 15 track. track. Um, but yeah, like, you know, I, I grew up like pouring over these albums and like reading like lyrics and like looking at the art and stuff. And now I have that. And it's just so, <laughs> it's so surreal. But it feels like it was a long time in the making, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. All the so. best things are. It's a gift. It's a gift to the world, right? You, you yeah, know. Absolutely. This thing takes it. It takes as long as it takes, but you get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. Um, in the light of uh, COVID, in the light of all this going on. By the way, if anyone that's listening, the the, the the album's likely to be already out and live. So you know, go check that. Go check it. Check it. Check it. We'll make sure this is out in time. Um, but in light of COVID and uh, all the other crazy shenanigans that the world is throwing our way at the moment you um i guess these these events like podcasts are you know the the equivocal of getting the message out there where you'd normally be in doing live gigs right absolutely absolutely yeah because um okay so when this all popped off i was on tour with rhapsody oh, shit. And it was funny because not funny it wasn't funny at all but it okay. was shocking that when we were doing the East Coast dates, cities were literally being shut down right as we left them. <gasps> so, like... So you were leaving, it's just like... As you were leaving, yeah. the whole thing was just getting so shut down. Left Seattle, and we hear that Seattle is now on lockdown. Wow. And then, so, like, that, will, that was what was happening. Like, I had another show. I was going to, you know, on our break during the, the tour, I was going to go back and do a show in Seattle, and they were like, nah, that's canceled. So like we were literally leaving states as like they were um, imposing these restrictions and we got to do all of the day. You know, it was weird because the energy had started shifting. Like after my shows, I go out and like hug supporters and talk to them and we're all up in each other's faces and stuff. And mm. I had to like kind of scale back on that, you know, cool, sure. it, felt, um, it felt wrong. You know, mm-hmm. and I understood, you know, why why I was doing it. I understood, you know, it was important for me to protect both my health and the health of, you know, the people who come to the shows. But it sure. just felt, I, I could feel that things were shifting. And mm-hmm. I had, like, right when I got back home, I was supposed to leave out a week later and do a tour in Europe, of course. Well, we, we ended up having to cancel the last show on the Rhapsody Tour because, again, like, all these cities were um, shutting down. So they shut down North Carolina right before that last show. And then I was going to come home and leave out to go to Europe and that got canceled. And so like everything just got thrown off because I had my whole summer like planned out with shows and stuff that was going to be happening. And like you said, like it's this new reality that we're now living in where we're now doing Zoom interviews and we're, um, doing uh virtual concerts and having to be more mm. on lives and social media and stuff like that and it's this total shift and yeah. this framing of what um being an artist is in that performative piece of being an artist and that, for a minute like it took me a while to adjust to that because i'm not like a super internet person like i'm good at it i can navigate it but i don't care for it yeah. you know yeah, yeah, I no, I feel care it. to be, like in people's faces. I care to be like vibing off of people's energy, and you know, yeah, what I mean? I'm, I'm exactly the same. It's like okay, there are a few benefits that could kick in. Like once we are able to go into the live arenas and watch you do your thing and be a part of the crowd, be a part of the club, be be together again. There still will be this, which I think has grown in the, f- in the face of adversity. We have got this still, and I, I don't think that skill set that we're talking about here, face one to one, will change when we get face to face. I think this will be another facet. You know, it's been another yeah. set skill that we've learned, right? Yeah, it will. Kind of like that. Kind of like that. Cool though, because you know, for me, I feel like the this this kind of format, it's can be a bit more conversational. You know what mm. I mean? Like it's mm. a bit more natural than the the studio setup to me. Like for me, I, I feel like this, like a bit of, I get a bit of anxiety, like with all those microphones and like the headphones and, like, mm. and stuff. But like this feels like, oh, I'm just on a video chat with the homie. 
you know? Yeah, hey, 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 that's what it is, baby. That's how it is. Um, a thousand percent, thousand percent. It's a good feeling. I mean, let's let's be let's be honest. Would Killer Keller have ever met Sarok in any other situation? Probably not. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's it's it has its it has its purpose and. uh Again, you just take, taking these opportunities of like, okay, right. So this is what artists are very good at doing this. Like, very good at like adapting. Like Bruce Lee once said, you know, flow like water, isn't it? You know, you just react to the ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to. I mean, that's a part of what you have to do to like just kind of hone and better your skill set anyway, just as a lyricist. So to be able to adapt to like changes in the way that we present our art is like crucial to your survival <laughs> it's to survival yeah yeah and survival is key you know i mean godspeed that this this thing you know we go through this this thing quick enough but uh it does separate the wheat from the strong doesn't it in the musical sense in the artistry sense like yeah. do you know what i mean it's fight or flight time right yeah yeah and i think that's honestly have has been that honestly has been one of our strengths, like for mm. me, um, being an independent artist, uh, when I was coming up, the big thing for me that separated me from my peers was that we were relentless on like doing shooting videos, Hell yeah, like doing like putting stuff up on social media, making our own flyers, and and this is before like people were really utilizing the I mean, social media was starting to be Facebook was there, but Instagram, I don't know if it had popped off yet. And like people were operating on this old formula of like, you put, you get your album out and then you put out like two or three singles and that's it. Yeah. We were shooting a video for almost every song that we did. And you know, like yeah, yeah. I think that that kind of, I guess, forward thinking that's right that kind of separated me and, and put me on the radar of people who would have normally not seen me but because I was like creating so much content you know mm. I was able to like travel outside of Atlanta very early on and then start traveling internationally very early on that's just um, crazy isn't it the way that that plays out like that is is mad that I, I remember um, people like screwing about LimeWire and stuff, you know, and it, but, but then how would earth would you have ever got so what? far out into the world? Right, right. I forgot about LimeWire. <laughs> <laughs> the albums, the songs, boy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's it, Lars? All ripped from Metallica, you know, just climbing the walls of LimeWire, trying to stop everybody ripping his albums off. It just didn't work. Yeah. And then, you know, your music is out there now. I mean, and now we have streaming platforms where people can listen to all this stuff for free, you know? Mm. So um, it's interesting. I like your... Uh, I love that you're like such a hip hop head, but then you throw in Metallica and you throw in like the Beatles and. and all oh, that. believe me, I'm I'm the worst man. I'm like I'm into all sorts of that stuff. Like I like music with balls. You know what I mean? I like music with balls. Yeah, that's, that's kind of essentially my thing. If it's got a message, I'm in. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, you've got to be, right? You've got to be. Um, and this age of technology whereby you've got Spotify taking full advantage of, like, the innocence of the mind of, of artistry, desperate to get out there. You throw it out on vinyl and there's something uh, romantic and pretty, pretty cool about that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like it's it, people, I don't know, People see it as like, I mean, it's, it's become like a collector's, it's a collector's album. I mean, yeah. a collector's piece, you know, at this yeah. point. Whereas yeah. once that was just, that was just how you listen to music. Yeah. Now, like, it's a really special thing that, you know, a, a supporter can own from you. And, mm. you know, um, it's a, an additional kind of piece of art, especially if you have like a little, you know, additional, like, cute little elements that aren't available mm. in form or whatever. And it's just, um, it's perfect. I love it. 
it's it's really cool. It's really cool. I, I was trying to get cassettes. We don't have cassettes, but not a lot of people have um the little boom boxes. So yeah. <laughs> that didn't make much fiscal sense, but maybe we'll have that on the road. Cassettes are a whole different thing because you know when you used to unroll that and just like check everything, it was just like oh, one big, yeah, toilet I, roll of yeah. awesome. Yeah, I still have a couple of like cassette tapes from back in the day, which you know I have a, a boombox, but um, I just hold on to them just because it's just special, you know. Yo, you know my favorite uh, ever cover of that era that that ah. Oh. You know, Far Side Bizarre Ride, that cover with the the fucked a lot artwork with the the um the roller coaster. It didn't do it justice on the albums, but when you saw it on cassette, the way it played out, it unfolded, and it was just like one big roller coaster cartoon. It was just incredible. Lo- oh my god, that was just the artwork actually made the music even better, and that that, that that's that's definitely. A, you know, um, a compliment to the era of tape and vinyl is like you had to have the whole thing, right? It had to be, do you know, what yeah. I mean, representative of the music. Mm-hmm. And then, how else are you going to find the, the the special lyric, those lyrics to like those? You might know the whole joint except for like one little, like what did you say right there? What's that ad lib? Like yeah. they put ad libs in there, the oohs and ahs. I'm like, oh, that's what they were saying. <laughs> yeah. Like- I used to love that. And it's, yeah, it's just things like that. We were so lucky to have grown up uh, in an era that did, you know, that, that was, was, was totally like inclusive of all those extra trimmings of, of, of what soon would become like, you know, not so regular to see anymore, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So cool. So cool. So cool. Well, I won't be taking up any more of your time, Miss. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you. This is great. Yeah, it's a vibe, right? Loved it. Loved it. Um, so I rock, hold tight. Album on its way. Well, it, it, it'll be out by now, right? It'll be out. Um, but look, best of luck with everything. Keep your head up. Keep it moving. Thank you. Thank you. So shout out to RSC Rocksteady crew in the building. Yeah, I'm Rocksteady. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I beatbox. That's what I do for a living. Wow. You know, Saul Messiah, my producer, he's also, he was also a member, or I guess still is, a member of Rocksteady School as well. Stop it. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm the UK chapter. Dope. Yeah, he danced with Crazy Legs and Mr. Wiggles. <gasps> yep. That's cold. Tell him I say what's up, crew member in the house. Hey, we have to tell all these stories. And- <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're cool. This the part one, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna follow you on Instagram. I'm going to do it straight away. So, um, like thank you so much, my dear. Smashed thank it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Stay lucky, Sarah. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Killer Podcast. Big shout, Sarah, inside the place, doing it live and lovely over here. All right, international vibes. Spread the word. Tell a friend to tell a friend. We're out like it was out of fashion. You stay lucky now. Peace. <laughs>